Welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. Today I'm joined by Will Whittam. Uh, Will, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself to our international audience today. So over to you, Will. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me, Simon. This is actually my first time appearing as a guest on a podcast. Um, I do a lot of time sitting behind the mic hosting podcasts, um, mainly for the CMO Combo podcast for the CMO Alliance community, which is a podcast aimed at helping marketing leaders elevate their role, understand what's going on in the world right now, and basically share insights and ideas. Um, I got into that role um, from a content marketing background. Um, I don't just do the podcast hosting. I do all the other content related to the community, which includes reports, articles, working on a video strategy, but that is work in progress right now. And just about any other piece of written content that goes out of the um, out of the community. Um, how I got into marketing in the first place, um, I started off, well, my academic backgrounds in English literature. I went to a University of Edinburgh to study that, which was absolutely fantastic, but doesn't really set you up for a future career English lit, um, unless you want to be in academia or you want to be in publishing. It's really hard to actually find a job. So felt a bit lost after I graduated. I was lucky enough to have a bit of money tucked away. So I went traveling. And while I was traveling, I was watching a lot of a little show called Mad Men. And I was seeing a lot of amazing adverts on the sides of buildings in like Times Square, New York, and in Tokyo and in Shanghai. And I was like, huh, this advertising, it seems like a seems like it could be pretty cool. Um, so I started exploring that, um, managed to find a really cool program at the um, Manchester Metropolitan University, um, all about creative advertising, all about developing marketing strategies um, in, I think it was, yeah, it is an MSc. So yeah, Master of Sciences on that one. And really just opened up my mind to the possibilities of what advertising and marketing would be in terms of being able to tell stories, being able to explore different things, and just a different variety of stuff you could be tackling as well from a day to day. It could be different channels, it could be different topics, it could be different industries that you're doing the marketing for. Um, so on the back of that, I've been quite fortunate, I suppose, to work in quite a lot of different industries, a lot of different verticals, got a good mix of B2B and B2C. I've even got some agency experience as well in there. Um, so things were looking really great in terms of like that career path until 2020 hit. And the pandemic happened and my career took a bit of a stall for a while, just looking for work and everything. It was, I know it was tough for a lot of people out there. And I was really fortunate to come across the, um, the Alliance, which wasn't the Alliance at the time. They were still operating under the product marketing Alliance as their main port of call. And Brian and Rich, uh, my CMO and CEO took a punt on me to basically run their content strategy from the ground up for CMO Alliance. And, yeah, the rest is history, I suppose. Like Things have been going great there and looking forward to doing more work with them in the future. Well, listen, thanks. So from Mad Men to the CMO Alliance and the wider <laughs> Alliance group, yeah. and you mentioned Brian and is Richard King there. Yeah. And um, maybe could you just spend a moment, Will, just ha helping people to understand the breadth of that organization? Because... We mentioned the CMO Alliance, and I'm I'm delighted. You know, I'm an ambassador of the CMO oh, Alliance, yes. so yeah. I'm very proud of what that organisation does. And you were there from the very beginning, helping grow that into this global community and organisation that it is today. But the Alliance and the other brands you mentioned, the Product uh, Marketing Alliance, and uh, like you have the Revenue Marketing Alliance, and there's, mm -hmm. there's other elements to the Alliance group, uh, if I'm using the term correctly. Could you maybe just unpack that a little bit? Uh, I mean, I, we have all these different communities now, and it seems like we're launching new ones every day. Um, just as we find more opportunities for ways to help businesses, not just businesses, actually, ways to help individuals do their best in their roles. Um, so a lot of them are marketing-related. Product Marketing Alliance was sort of the core um, original community that launched, but everything sort of branched off that as that grew and grew into all these different communities as well so we have marketing related ones we have the revenue marketing alliance of course as you said we have stuff that's marketing adjacent we have the customer um, customer success collective we have the sales enablement collective we have stuff about product development now um, which is the product led alliance i mean i could sit here all day and list all the different communities actually and that might be a bit of a test for my memory because as i said we're adding new ones all the time but basically the business development groups um to really help individuals often in often 
practices within business that aren't very well understood by people outside of it. So you might think as a marketer, the CMO role is really obvious, but to a non-marketer, they, they don't often know what CMOs do in their job. They don't know what the function of marketing is within a business. And basically we want to equip practitioners within these different functions, not just with the tools for themselves to succeed, but to help them help other people understand what they're doing, which will help their own business development as well, their own um, career progression. I think one of the biggest issues facing CMOs at the moment is sort of a misunderstanding over the marketing function within a business, misalignment with the rest of the C-suite. So by equipping CMOs with the ways of communicating their value more clearly, it should hopefully help them with that. I know you're aware of the stat, uh, Simon, how short the uh, the tenure is for, for CMOs out there. It's a very precarious position for a lot of people. Well, thanks, Will. Thanks for sharing that, because I just wanted the audience to get a sense of the sort of scale, because we're not talking about a small community here. There, there are many communities, as you mentioned, but it has a global reach. And every time I look, there's something new coming out uh, from the Alliance, from the CMO Alliance, and from all the other groups and communities that you have. So from somebody who's responsible for that strategy and that content output, it must be pretty busy from your perspective. Oh, it's, in, it's incredibly busy, but we're, we're very fortunate to have such a great um, support system at the, um, at the Alliance group. Um, we, we take very much sort of like a content focused approach to things, which means content not only drives everything that we do in terms of the different events, the different courses that we put out. Um, it means that we get a lot of feedback from that in reverse as well. So it becomes a very nice like loop and also the communities as well are absolutely invaluable in terms of finding out what topics need to be covered, finding collaborators and people to work with on it. I mean, the, the reason we went with um, the podcast CMO combo, sort of like the core piece of content in the first place is because we realized pretty quickly that uh, CMOs don't often have time to sit down and write loads and loads of articles for us, but they do have time to jump on a mic and talk to me about a subject that they know really well for about 40 to 40 minutes to an hour uh, max. So yeah, it's, it is a lot of work, but it's a lot of rewarding work as well. Right? When you get a good piece of content out there, a good report out there, and you start seeing the responses from not just your own peers, but also like marketing leaders, people that you didn't even know you were on the radar of, it's it's a really, really sort of real boost to your confidence and your ego as well. I think ego is important as a marketer. You have to be kind of able to back yourself in some respect. So having that validation from external sources can be really helpful like we got our spotify wrapped at the end of last year for cmo convo and it turns out we're in 28 different countries now which is incredible the content that i'm producing content that i'm helping produce is being consumed and valued by these people all over the world so a lot of work but it is good payoff at the end i'd say no, it's great. And as somebody who's been a creative copywriter and somebody who's been a, you know, a senior copywriter uh, along the journey, it's not easy sometimes getting that content together in a, in a copywriting world. And then when you add in the, uh, the medium of audio and uh, podcast, as you say, um, it's making sure that you reach that right audience, but the CMO convo, you've pretty much pioneered that, um, and it, it's taken a lot of a lot of discussions, a lot of conversations with CMOs. But the thing that I do like about it, and I'd like to ask you in a moment to maybe just expand on this a little bit for me. But the thing that I like about it is not only do you you meet with some fascinating CMOs and they sort of, you know, you get into the nitty gritty with them. But it's also a great resource, I think, for people who are maybe looking to move into a CMO role or they're looking to progress their career in that sort of marketing uh, area, you know, a head of marketing or whatever their, whatever their job title is. And it's almost become this library of information that people can go into and check out and learn from other CMOs around the world. And as you say, 22 countries, wow, um, it's grown fast. It is, yeah, for sure. And uh, you, you're right in terms of it being sort of this l library resource for people. Um, going back to the, the Spotify wrapped findings, they they presented our our listener profile and it was the, the historian, which meant that people did go back and listen to prior episodes. So they might catch the newest episode, but then they'll go back and try and track down episodes of, on similar topics or maybe something different. And yeah, it's really great that it can exist as this uh, this library, this resource of people uh, for people, and it's not just 
great in that respect it works really well in terms of repurposing for other forms of content as well so obviously there's written content that we pulled out of it um we use parts of it in our courses we use parts of it to inspire the events um often source speakers for our events from the the guests that we have on the show and vice versa um and we're as i said we're working on a video strategy related to it as well but watch this space on that i don't have much more to share on that at this stage I understood. And do you, do you also find there's a knock on effect, even though the CMO convo that we're talking about specifically here, that podcast, but do you find it also helps drive interest and demand in the other communities and the other parts of the Alliance group, even though it's very CMO convo, uh, you know, CMO Alliance type focused? I mean, I, I like to think it does. Um, and I do work closely with the rest of the content team who are uh, connected to these different communities and do host their own shows to make sure there is some sort of cross pollination going on there. So if I have a guest that I think will be right for a different community, I'll often share them with another um, with another one of the, the podcast hosts. Um, so yeah, it does sort of become this sort of mix, the swirl of um, all these different guests and stuff floating around. So if you find a guest on one of our shows, it's quite likely they might appear on a different one of the shows as well. So there is cross, um, cross pollination there. And in terms of attracting them to the the other ones, if, the, if we do reference something specific to another community, like for example, revenue marketing, we're doing a lot of stuff about sales and marketing alignment on CMO Combo. Like we will reference the other communities as well. Like we don't just exist in a vacuum, so to speak. Like we do try and make sure that we are interconnected. There's lots of Venn diagrams out there that we have showing like the different connections between the different communities, which can be really helpful, especially with the number of new communities that are getting launched all the time. So yeah, but educating ourselves about what the other community is about is just as important as us being educated about our own communities at the same time. And you mentioned the word community there a few times. And I suppose the thing with the CMO Alliance, it does feel like this international community of people coming together. And you've worked quite hard behind the scenes, I know, uh, because I've, I've, I've accessed the, the tools and the platforms to build this sort of online community. So in addition to sort of the content that's sort of sent out from your organization there's a thriving community behind the scenes where people are having these conversations for sure yeah and i can't take too much credit for that we have a fantastic community management team who are doing absolutely gangbusters at the moment in terms of uh, promoting engagement working on not just online events offline events as well um across all the different communities it's incredibly impressive the work they do in that respect um and those kinds of communities are incredibly helpful to us as a content team as well, um, in terms of being able to float ideas past people, just paying attention to what the different discussions are can be a really important spark of the types of content that we should be promoting, the types of um, topics that we need to be addressing. Um, like, yeah, it's an incredible resource having these communities available, um, both in terms of floating the um, floating ideas past people, um, paying attention to the discussions that are, being, that are happening there. Like the number of different topics that have arisen just based on seeing other community members chat about something like it's a list as long as your arm when you get right down to it um and that's kind of the approach that we've taken right from day one when it comes to content strategies and i think it's a very important one for any type of marketing whether you're marketing to a community or marketing to others is to actually pay attention to what your customers are saying to each other um, the first thing i did in this role was just jump on a load of calls with cmos to work out what is actually going to be valuable to you? What types of content do you enjoy? What types of topics are important to you right now? Because at the end of the day, I haven't been a CMO. I'm not a CMO. So I need to know what the challenges are to the role. And the best way to do that is to talk to your audience that you're actually going to be addressing. Yeah, I love that. And uh, the last thing, because I do want to ask you some other questions as well, but the, the last thing just on the podcast um, because it continues to grow, you must have gone through some learning trials and errors and some pain <laughs> and some some tears along the way. When you look back, is there any is there any sort of things that you do in your workflow now that you wish you would have started earlier? Or is there any advice you'd give to anybody who's maybe looking to grow their own podcast? I think my, my best advice would be to um, always have an intro call with your guests so you get an idea for bit of the patter with them get to know them get to know how easy they are going to be a guest like how much you have to do some coaxing out that kind of thing like if you jump into a call like completely blind with someone that you've never spoken to before 
then you've got no idea. You've got no idea to how to spark up rapport with someone. You've got no idea how easy it is to get answers out of them. So having that intro call is absolutely essential. Um, the other thing I'd say would probably be my biggest learning from it is just to don't have assumptions about what makes a good episode of a podcast, particularly when it's something related to a business thing. Like we had a lot of stuff about the guideline. You can read all these guidelines about what is like the perfect podcast length and stuff like that. And you had this idea that it needs to be sort of fairly mass appeal. But one of our most popular episodes last year um, was way longer than our usual length. And it was on quite a niche industry as well. And yet that was by far and away our most popular episode last year. Like, and it just completely destroyed any preconceptions that I might have over what makes a good episode. So have an open mind, be open to having like niche things on it that you might not expect people to like and respond to because it could absolutely blow you away and you'll be very, very impressed with the results. I, I like that a lot because sometimes when you when you are very formulaic, uh, and you don't try something new or you don't have a particular guest on because you kind of think, well, are, are they the right fit? Are they the right guest, et cetera? But sometimes you, you're surprised, aren't you? It almost blindsides you that the thing that you think is going to be the smash hit success isn't. And the one that you thought or you weren't maybe necessarily sure of, you get a little bit of good fortune sometimes and you go, wow, that one was really really interest people were really interested in that one and you have to go back and kind of learn and understand well, what happened there exactly you know and as you say an episode that goes a lot longer than your typical in a niche that maybe isn't the standard um or sorry a niche that is isn't typically uh, a broad topic or a broad appeal and yet you find people are really attracted to it you know um and i think is there something to do will with um consistency here as well because you're putting out good content on a regular basis do you think that plays a part I'd, I'd say consistency is important both in terms of developing your skills as a podcaster but also keeping your audience engaged as well like having a regular release schedule is absolutely essential because it means that they know exactly when the new content's going to come out they don't even have to be i mean of course you want them to be subscribers you want them to get email alerts and stuff but if they know when an episode's coming out they don't even have to be subscribers they know exactly when they can jump on so having a weekly cadence for the podcast it is a lot of pressure to get that amount of episodes going but also it's right for the audience as well you've got to think about that a lot of the topics we talk about in the show are very up to the date, very relevant to what's going on right now. We could be talking about stuff to do with the economy. We could be talking about stuff to do with politics or anything that's going on, sort of like latest marketing news. And if you're not releasing that fairly close to the recording, then you can you can sound foolish. One of the episodes we recorded um, back in 2021, was it 20? Yeah, 2021. Um, and it was about the world opening up, the pandemic restrictions uh, lifting and basically how consumers can behave in that environment. Recording was great and it was very apt for what was ta being talked about right then. Uh, I think we actually recorded it on what was called Freedom Day in the UK when they lifted all those restrictions. Fast forward two months and all those restrictions were back in place and we still hadn't released that episode because we were on a, a slower cadence at that point. And that was what made me realize we needed to go for a very, very regular podcast and try and make sure that we're hitting these these kind of up-to-date topics at the same at the right time that's great advice uh thanks for sharing that will and um just to change gears a little bit because we're kind of geeking out a bit here on podcasts but <laughs> i wanted to ask you about um your own learning style and the way you like to take on board information so are you one of the people that because you produce a podcast you're also a bit of a podcast fanatic you're constantly listening to podcasts when you can uh, or are you a book reader do you like you know picking up a hard copy are you an audio book you know audible type person or do you just like talking to people you know uh, how does that work for you I'm, I'm, I'm gonna come across as an absolute heretic right now Simon but I actually don't listen to many podcasts at all like it's not my preferred way of absorbing information i know it's very popular with a lot of people i do see the value to it but for me personally um i mean with my literature background of course i love reading books i mean can't get away from them um i love a good i'd love like visual stuff in general as well like i love documentaries i love watching that kind of stuff um and again like, talking to people as i said like i've learned a lot just from hosting the podcast like i am talking to the marketing leaders and it's having those kinds of conversations that i think is really going to help shape 
my career development in the future. So I love talking to people. It's one of my favorite parts of the job. So I'm very fortunate in that respect. I'm getting a lot of benefit from it as well as hopefully contributing something valuable to the business. Yeah, and it, it, it's often surprising um, when you talk to a podcaster and, and you ask that question, and they say, well, actually, do you know what? I prefer reading or <laughs> I, I learn so much from my guests. That's another thing you hear quite common from podcast hosts because you 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 have this rich um, ensemble of information available to you uh, that just keeps coming into you. And it is a great learning tool, I think, and a great way to uh, meet people and to share that information uh, and to build relationships and community too. I think it really, it really, really helps. But you also mentioned something uh, quite interesting there in terms of visual, you know, that you like to learn visually, whether that's documentaries uh, or whatever. Uh, and it is quite interesting as podcasting is traditionally an audio only, you know, I don't want to get into the what what is a podcast question, <laughs> but we are seeing more and more people listen uh, passively to podcasts on things like YouTube. This podcast, for example, goes out as video and audio. Um, I'm just wondered on your on your thoughts on that. So, in, in terms of like why podcasts are popular in that in sort of like the passive listening and stuff, I think it's it's very obvious why it is. It allows you to do other things while you're absorbing information, like. You can't read a book effectively while you're trying to cook dinner. You can't read a book while you're going for a run. You can't like you can't watch a documentary. Well, I suppose you can watch a documentary while you're lifting weights. I haven't tried it, but I'm I'm sure there's some like geek, uh, muscly geeks out there who love to do that. Um, but in terms of like people watching other people on podcasts, I think people do like to see the faces of people who are talking to each other. Um, I think people like to see the sort of, like the reactions, see the the rapport bouncing off each other. There's a lot that can be said from people's facial expressions that don't necessarily get communicated audibly. Audibly, um, like when I'm recording a podcast, like I hate being in a situation where a guest doesn't want their mic on, um, not the mic, the um, the camera on, because I want to be able to see what they're saying, like how they're saying things. I want to see their facial expressions while I'm asking them certain questions, so I can sort of gauge what the response is going to be like, get an idea for when they're even just simple things like knowing when they're going to finish talking. Like it's a bit hard to do that over the phone. Like it takes a lot of editing when you're doing it without, without a camera, I find. But I think also it's just human nature as well to want to see people's faces. Like we are attracted to looking at other people's faces and seeing and building a connection with them that way. Um, so I can perfectly see why podcasts are becoming more popular in that kind of medium. Um, something that we're definitely exploring, something that we're looking into for CMO Convo. But as I said, watch this space when it comes to the video strategy. So listen, um, the other thing I wanted to ask is around that sort of podcasting technology stack, um, because the world is, at the time of recording this, the hot topic is AI. And everybody's talking about all these wonderful AI tools, whether it's text or visual, uh, video. There's an awful lot of voice AI happening at the moment too. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be that it, if it isn't in your workflow today, it probably is going to be in the not too distant future. Are you looking into that? Are you uh, implementing any AI type technologies in anything that you do? at the CMO Alliance or the CMO Convo at this we're stage? We're, we're definitely exploring the possibilities at the moment. Of course, I mean, I think every copywriter has had to go on chat GPT at some point. Um, we're exploring how we can utilize that effectively. I think human element to it is still absolutely essential. Um, like you can get a summary of things from chat GPT, but in terms of to know like what are the actual key important points in, in order to know in order to write something that people actually want to read as well. Like, I think that's something that gets lost in this talk about AI. Like it's all well and good saying, oh, it can pump out a thousand words quicker than like a thousand copywriters could. But is it pumping out a thousand words that someone's actually going to enjoy reading at the end of the day? Um, like Nick Cave had a good analysis of someone trying to write songs based on his style using chat GPT. And he called it an absurd mockery of trying to be human or something along those lines, which is quite heavy. I mean, it's Nick Cave, so he would kind of talk in those kinds of terms, but 
you can see that I think with AI technology at the moment, it's trying to be human and you're noticing the differences. I think it all plays into that sort of uncanny valley that comes with the AI and robotics and that kind of stuff where it comes to mimicking humans. When it comes to sort of AI applications in podcasting, maybe that's going to come up at some point soon. Maybe we're going to see some AI podcast hosts. I know there are some AI Twitch streamers out there at the moment. Um, a lot of them have been getting into trouble because they've been based on machine learning and chatbots in their communities, which have led to them saying some very, very dodgy things about other races or other genders, which you definitely don't want from a sponsored podcast or a business podcast, that kind of thing. Um, I'm hoping my position as a podcast host is secure for a few more years, at least. I'll be interested to see what comes about, of course. But I think as a marketer and as someone just in working in a business in general these days, you've got to keep your eye on the pulse when it comes to AI. Like there's a lot of new applications being rolled out all the time. If you'd asked me this time last year, if people were going to be having serious conversations about AI writing the content strategies for entire companies, I would have said, yeah, your daft were miles off. And then ChatGPT came out and now suddenly my LinkedIn stream is just full of people having these discussions. And our community is full of people having these discussions as well. Our content teams having these discussions as well. So yeah, just keep your eye open and keep your finger on the pulse, I think, when it comes to AI. Yeah, and I suppose particularly with your audience and your community being CMOs predominantly, um, it's a hot topic for them right now uh, because it is impacting the world of content for good and for bad. And uh, I like some of your earlier comments, and I was I was going to jump in and say spoken like a true copywriter, you know, um, <laughs> b- because there is that element too, you know, is somebody going to read this? Um and you know, maybe maybe we end up at working with the tools as opposed to against the tools. But it's it's early days. But I've said this on a couple of episodes with people I've been talking to around AI. It feels like we're in for a step change. It feels like this is just beginning. But uh, we will see. We will see. Yeah, we will. We will see. Hopefully, we'll be seeing it from a happy position and not on the breadline, Simon. But we'll we'll see for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, AI overlords are certainly on the way. That's for sure, Will. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on a little bit more again, I wanted to ask you about throughout your career, whether it was back back in your studies when you were a child, uh, whether you're looking up at that big madman poster <laughs> or whether you're recording the episode last week talking to some CMO who's uh, offering up some great information on your own podcast, but you must come across or somebody must have imparted some advice to you that stuck with you that you think is really great advice. Uh, when I ask you that question, what springs to mind? I think probably the best advice I ever got in terms of being a marketer and being someone who works in business is just to not take things personally. Like Working in an agency environment, I think, is a great way to develop that kind of callous, that kind of hard shell to negative feedback i mean i think every every single person who's ever worked in an agency probably has stories about nightmare clients and clients that you just can't please and you're just getting mountains and mountains of negative feedback and my creative director at the time just took me aside when i was obviously despairing over keeping this client happy and just said to me like listen we know you're doing the right thing we know you're doing good work the client doesn't really have a clue but you just got to keep them happy at the end of the day and if you're not happy with the work that you're putting out to them if they're happy that's what matters at the end of the day like you just go home take your coat off take your business coat off maybe punch the wall a few times and then just step away and leave that feedback behind you um if it's really absurd stuff of course you need to take feedback on board if it is constructive stuff but if it is just an unpleasable client then they're unpleasable at the end of the day so do what they ask and get it out to them basically i think i think that's an interesting point because um at the end of the day particularly in an ancient relationship the client is ultimately paying for what what they think they want sometimes it's hard for a creative um whether a creative director or copywriter or an account director or whoever's working with them from the agency side sometimes it's hard to drive through a strategy and i think often overlooked in the cmo world is the the amount of rejection that you have to deal with when it comes to that balance between the creative side of what you're trying to do and you've also got to be able to communicate that message which isn't always easy uh depending on the audience and the the way 
uh, that they are looking to develop a particular strategy. So uh, ultimately, they come to you for advice and for expertise, but not always as receptive to listen to that expertise <laughs> and that advice. So there's a fine art. It's not just about creating the content. It's about also delivering the message and helping clients see it through. And I think that's a very interesting point um, that you that you've raised there. Um, you sure. I think, um, yeah, they, marketers as a whole, as a profession as a whole, are probably critiqued by non-practitioners more than any other that I can think of, at least within like a modern tech company. Like no one's going over to the development guys who haven't got like a development background saying, oh, your code's crap. Like, cause you don't understand the coding. You don't understand the background. No one's going over to the sales team. If you haven't got sales experience and saying, hey, listen, maybe you should be doing your, your pitches a bit differently. Whereas everyone seems to be able to comment on marketing. Everyone be, seems to have an opinion on what marketing should be and what good marketing is. And they'll, and they'll tell marketers and they'll tell you to your face whether they think your marketing is good or not, despite the lack thereof, of the lack of experience in that field. So you've got to build up that callus. I think you've got to be able to take like really negative, non-constructive feedback on the chin and just be able to walk away from it and be able to recognize when it is actually genuinely constructive stuff as well. I think that's a key skill, being able to sort of pass through the noise and see like what are the nuggets of wisdom that are actually going to improve your skills and improve your career as a whole. And when you look back again over your career to date, uh, have there been any particular people uh, that you've learned a lot of lot from or people that have inspired you along your journey or people that you look up to? Maybe it's a particular character trait, Will. Um, so yeah, uh, Peter Holden, uh, he was the, uh, the founder of an agency based in Manchester, um, when I was doing my masters, um, and he's, he's sadly passed away, away now, a big loss to the industry in Manchester. Um, but he was, he was a big influence on sort of how I developed my approach to marketing early on. Um, he was a guest lecturer a few times. Um, he's been in the industry since like the sixties, since those Mad Men days. So he quickly disabused me of my notions about 10 AM drinks and nine o'clock whiskey meetings and stuff like that. And really got me up to date on what, how, on what marketing is about these days. But the advice he gave on sort of like how to approach creativity in a professional environment, I think was absolutely illuminating and really, really helped me in terms of how I approach creativity there um in my career as well and that's basically like you can't squeeze blood from a stone like you need to be able to know when to step away from a problem from writer's block from a creative thing and let that fulminate in the back of your mind go off and do something else he recommended going to the pub but obviously that's not acceptable in modern, modern business culture i wish it was but anyway um just do something fun do something to take your mind off it and let that idea percolate in the back of your head and I think that kind of approach to creativity is something that should be encouraged across the board when it comes to creative industries, like giving people the time and space to actually think about things, to develop ideas at their own pace is the way you get your best creative work at the end of the day. Like, Sure, it's all great when you're like chasing a deadline and you've got things to do and you need to try and burn things out. That can feel really exciting when you get your adrenaline going. But is that the best way to be approaching things? Is that a a constructive way to be approaching things both from a personal standpoint and from a business standpoint as well that seems like it's going to lead to a lot of crunch and a lot of burnout which isn't a way to retain and develop talent in this industry i think yeah it, it's a great point you you remind me of there's a there's another uh person todd henry who you're probably familiar with but his podcast the accidental creative he, you know the whole premise of that is you know if you're in the kind of role where you've got to create on demand um come on invent something will come up with something <laughs> creative will you know come on simon um that sort of create on demand that instant it, it does lead to burnout in a lot of creatives and it it is important and i think you've said something really really um key there that sometimes you've got to step away from it and give it time to percolate and think it through a little bit and look at it from another perspective or through another lens um and the function of that creative work it's quite taxing and yet to some people who maybe aren't in a creative type of environment it can look as though it, it almost isn't work it's almost like you've got the best job um, but producing creative work that moves markets or helps people make decisions or changes the status quo or something 
it actually takes an awful lot of hard work. It does for sure. I mean, I think that's something I've been aware of since a very young age. Um, most of my family are, have an artistic background. My, my parents are both art teachers and they're both practicing artists. My, my little brother is a practicing, practicing artist as well. My sisters does a lot. My sister does a lot of graphic design. She does a lot of textile work as well. Um, so I know like it does take a lot of work to be creative, particularly if it's something that you're reliant on for, for money to pay the bills. And that can be hard enough when you're doing it for someone else's dollar, when you're like creating creative ideas for other people, when you're working in uh, advertising, marketing, seeing actual, I had to sound very terrible, so seeing actual creatives like artists out there who are jobbing and chasing clients and stuff like that and having their own personal work critiqued in a really like savage way sometimes, like it really puts things in perspective. I think like, at the end of the day, my creative role in marketing is my job. It's not my life. Whereas for my family members who are artists, that is their lives. And being able to separate that like negativity and that pressure is something that I can do because I do have the separation between my work life and my home life. But for them, it's a lot more difficult, I think. Um, and it really puts things in perspective for me when it, whenever I'm feeling a bit stressed or something at home or whenever I've got something to complain about um, with like my family and friends and stuff, like think about in context of like what they're going through as well and what pressures they're under. Um, it really, yeah, it really illuminates things for you for sure. No, I appreciate you saying that. Well, I think it's a good point that you're making there. And um, just to harken back to the days of Madison Avenue, <laughs> um, and you were mentioning that the 10 a.m. drinks and the, you know, <laughs> Uh, let's think about that creative solution um, in a bar. Uh, and the world moved on, obviously, and there was a lot wrong with that era too in lots of ways. But um, the point I'm going to, or the question I want to ask you and the point I'm sort of getting to here is today's world isn't just a world of print, you know, newspaper print ads, uh, television ads um, and radio ads there's a whole world of this digital platform now, you know, there's a social media, which has taken off by storm with some massive global companies, some of the mm -hmm. biggest in the world uh, with platforms and communities and content with user generated content with the AI, you know, metaverse stuff that we talked about with web three. Um, we've even got cryptocurrencies now and blockchain type technologies. So the, the tools that are available are changing rapidly there are, there are more avenues for content than there's ever been. And I'm just wondering in your views on that from a uh, the perspective of still having to get a core message through, does it come back to, well, ultimately you've got to know how to tell the story correctly, or does it come down to knowing your audience? Uh, does it come down to those sort of more traditional advertising beliefs and fundamentals that the likes of Ogilvy or Burnett's originally you know work through back in the the golden era uh, i use that in inverted commas of, of advertising but it's a very different complex fast-paced digital world today compared to say two or three different mediums none of that digital stuff really existed so i think we have different tools but i think the principles behind marketing are the same i, th I think as you said storytelling is absolutely at the core of what we do it's what attracted me to the business in the first place um I, like one of the earliest pieces of marketing in history is actually from pompeii there's this mosaic where they're advertising fish sauce which is very popular in roman times and if you look at that it follows the the the, the core principles of marketing it follows the the p's of marketing which if it something from 2000 years ago is still an effective piece of marketing on those principles then something today can still be built on those principles as well so as long as as long as you're following that sort of like the core values of marketing that is understanding your audience connecting up connecting with them on the right way and finding them in the right place because that's the other thing as well like we've got so many different places to find them so many different platforms to find them on i think sticking to those those key principles of marketing will always do well for you like it doesn't matter what tools you're using it doesn't matter what AI is pumping things out for you, as long as you're pointing it the right direction based on the core principles of marketing, I think you'll do fine. And I think that brings us back to something you mentioned earlier when you were talking about Spotify wrapped will that I think your profile or personality that it sort of 
um, gave you was uh, was a historian. Mm -hmm. uh, so people are going back and looking at your content. And that sort of is the question that I want to pose to you, because this noisy world that we live in, that yes, we still need to tell stories in, but it's noisier than ever. And to get that cut through, to get that message through, to reach that audience, it's quite challenging right now. So is it is it about you know, finding your niche more than ever? Is it about putting out that, and I use the term again in inverted commas, but this evergreen content that everybody talks about, so it, it does have a bit of a shelf life. Um, what, what do you think of from your perspective? Of course, I mean, it's a very, very complex landscape out there and it's very noisy and it's getting noisier all the, all the time. But if you look at the brands that are succeeding here, they are the ones who, who are basically finding a unique way to tell the stories, a unique way to present their messages. Um, one of my favorite brands out there at the moment is Gong. I'm very impressed with what UD Lerdegore has done there um, in terms of presenting a SaaS business in a completely different way and really standing out from the competitors, not just doing what the competitors are doing and trying to do something better in that respect. They're doing something completely different. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the term disruption. I think it gets thrown around too much, but I think that kind of approach to it to really sort of break the rules of what is expected of you in terms of a brand, in terms of the marketing you're doing, that's what's going to really carry us, carry a company through this kind of environment that we're in at the moment. And I think it's going to be incredibly important moving forwards with the economy the way it is, with a lot of marketing budgets getting slashed. It, being able to differentiate, di differentiate yourself clearly from the competition is going to be absolutely essential. And that's all about your branding, your positioning, and the way you tell your story. And they are the core, core principles of marketing going back hundreds of years. So it's still going to work, hopefully. Check in with me next year and we'll see what uh, my other different stories to tell. Yeah, thanks, Will. Some good points there. Um, so as we as we look forward, and as you work in your own busy environment, producing all this great content that you're producing, what are you thinking about for the next three, six, nine, 12 months? How are you planning? What are you hoping to achieve? What does your roadmap look like for you? Well, we have the the hundredth episode of CMO Combo coming up, so I'm I'm putting some plans together to do something special on that. Hopefully, it might be my first recording session in person with someone. I've done all these recordings over Zoom, all these recordings remotely. It'd be nice to get some people actually in a room together to talk about things. Um, I think it's all well and good us talking over Zoom, and we're talking over Zoom right now, and it, it is still very effective, but it's not the same as being like sat across from someone and be able to read their body language and actually really like lean into each other while you're having a chat kind of thing. So very much looking forward to doing something along those lines. In terms of what like the topics we're covering, like it is just about trying to survive as a CMO in this current environment with the, as I said, marketing budgets are being slashed across the board. There's a lot of redundancies going on in very major companies. So trying to find a way to navigate through that. And a lot of that is built going back to some very core principles, I think. And that's listening to your customers, responding to your customers correctly and being able to tell their story effectively to the rest of the C-suite. So those core principles, I think are going to be very important moving forward. Love that, Will. And listen, before we run out of time, is there anything else that we haven't touched on? Is there anything else you'd like to share with our worldwide audience today? And also, if people want to find out more about the podcast or about the CMO Alliance or the wider Alliance group, where are you sending people to these days, Will? Um, so in terms of connecting with me personally, um, I have a LinkedIn, which I'm perfectly happy to accept any connections to and chat to people on that. It's Will Whitham. Um, that also has a lot of links to the podcast on it. I've got set up as a creator profile. So we'll be able to get straight to the CMO Convo episodes and be able to get to the CMO Alliance uh, company profile. And then also, um, yeah, just check out the CMO Alliance as well. Check out the community, get involved there, um, have a chat with people and get to know the rest of the community and see the different topics that we're talking about. Like, There's always new stuff going on there. And in terms of the actual Alliance group, we have the, the Alliance group has a LinkedIn. I know there's quite a few other alliances out there. So hopefully there'll be a link to that in the uh, the description for this episode. Because um, I know it can be a little bit hard to discover on LinkedIn, but that's probably the best way to be able to see all the different communities that we have going, all the different stuff that we have going on. Or if you don't want to mess around with the whole LinkedIn thing, you can find us on cmoalliance.com directly or thealliance.io.
Well, thanks, Will. And I know you've got some interesting things coming up this year, which you you may not be able to talk about at this point. <laughs> uh, but it, you've got a, a heck of a year ahead of you. So I do wish you continued success with everything that you're doing. Congratulations on getting to the 100th episode. I shall look out for that for sure. <laughs> um and maybe maybe doing it in person that that would be a great thing to do for the 100th episode that would be really really cool uh, but I, i'd like to thank you will for spending time with me today it's been a great discussion we've covered everything to do with the cmo alliance and the, the the role of a cmo i appreciate your insights we've had a little trip down madison avenue too along the way <laughs> um but look that brings us nicely to the end of this episode with will Whitham and uh Thanks very much to Will. Thanks to everybody for watching and listening to this episode around the world. Uh, please like, follow, subscribe, do all the normal things you do to help support this podcast. And I hope that you'll join me back here for more conversations with creatives, leaders, and thinkers. So thank you, Will. It's been a pleasure to catch up with you, my friend. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much for having me.